so much. Are we good? Thank you all so much uh, for speak. Uh, and I'd like to say good afternoon to the students and faculty of the University of the District of Columbia. And especially Dr. Jillian Went for inviting me to give this talk today. And I would just and I would just like to share with you guys a bit about uh, my journey uh, in STEM. You heard a lot about, you know, what I've done, but there's some background to what it is that I've done. Basically, me being, you know, have setting goals and working towards achieving those goals, regardless of whatever obstacles I um, have faced. And I hope that my journey will inspire some of you out there to, you know, see your obstacles and not deter or run away from your goals, but actually to sink in and actually uh, achieve your goals. And so, as uh, Dr. Went mentioned, um, I'm currently a biomedical life scientist uh, with Lidos, where I uh, uh, work for the Department of Defense's uh, U.S. Army Medical Research and uh, Material Command. And my time within Lido, so that's what I do, so that's my customer uh, focus, that's what I get paid to do. Uh, but for me, I always had this uh, desire to give back and to contribute to my community in more than just my job function. And so that's one of the reasons why I um, I became a founder and a chair of the African American uh, Lidos Network Employee Resource Groups. And as you guys enter into the workforce, I want you guys to be uh, cognizant of the fact that employee resource groups are wonderful resources for uh, employees within an organization. So like with a company like Lidos, which is 33,000 people, uh, the minority population is kind of small. You know, uh, Well, it's like 10%, if you will, of them. Uh, and so to have a group of people that that um, that have similar backgrounds and similar interests as you, it's very comforting, uh, and and you can get the opportunity to celebrate your culture. It's a very comforting thing within an organization of like 33,000 people, where you may not see people that look like yourself uh, on a day on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's good to have that connection. And uh, when I realized that we didn't have one, uh, uh, me and a couple of my colleagues got together and we said, okay. We must, uh, we must actually do this so that we can create a better environment for our fellow employees. Uh, and in addition to that, um, working with the Howard University Strategic University Alliance, that's really uh, a wonderful thing for me to do to give back to Howard and actually to engage with students. Actually, we focus on the School of Engineering. Uh, we're trying to recruit computer scientists. Um, we actually, and also cybersecurity experts within uh, Howard to uh, come to uh, Lidos and um, contribute their uh, uh, skills and expertise to our scientific core. Uh, so, I, and I want to talk today a bit about what my journey has been and actually how I got there. And to be honest, when I was first asked to give this talk, I was a little nervous because I, I really haven't done much or I felt like I hadn't done much <laughs> in, my, in my, you know, you, you just do. You know what I mean? You just do, and you really don't look back. And it wasn't until I start. wasn't until I, she was reading, actually. I was like, oh my god, I did all that. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I thought that was, um, yeah, I was quite impressed with myself. <laughs> but luckily, what I had was a wonderful group of family and friends that, that encouraged me to share my experience. And they said, you must do it. So that's what it was. So that's why I'm here today. And I really do appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for all of your help. <laughs> and so throughout my presentation, I, I not only want to share my, my uh, experience, I also want to share some facts and figures about uh, uh, women in STEM. At first, my, my title was Women of Color in STEM. Uh, don't talk about it, be about it. But when you start to look at the numbers, it's really women in general. It's not even a minority issue. It's, it's just women. Uh, and so I just change it to women in STEM. Don't talk about it. Be about it. And I know there are males in this audience. And I don't want to bash men or anything like that. I just want you to understand what women actually go through. Uh, being a woman and you know trying to uh, make their mark in a field where people may doubt you. 
uh, it's, it, it can be pretty challenging. So this is in no way an attempt to say, you know, men have been oppressing women. It's just an attempt to say, hey, this is what we're going through so that you know going into your career, this is what you're up against. But regardless of that, you must still persevere and you have to anybody deter you from your goal. And in addition to that, and so some of you might ask like why the title, don't talk about it, be about it. For me, that's a mantra in my life. I said I wanted to be a scientist and I, well, I said I wanted to get my PhD and I set a goal and no matter what anybody said, no matter what happened, I achieved my goal. And in addition to that, I broadened my understanding of what the sciences are, like what it means to be a scientist. It doesn't mean you look straight you know, into just being in the lab or doing that one job. It actually means you broaden it and you see what, so for me, being a, a bench top scientist, it's not only working on this one project, on manganese superoxide dismutase, or on um, uh, HMGA1 protein. It's actually seeing where that goes. So if I find an interesting finding, how do I get from the bench to the bedside? And not necessarily to say that I have to do that, but it's an understanding because it gives more, it gives a greater amount of um, uh, pride in your work because you're saying you can actually impact people's lives. And for me, I like to know like the big picture. I'm, I'm kind of like a big picture person, if you will. So I like from the beginning to the end, and I like to deep dive in things that I am interested in. And so, uh, so for me, and so that's the background for my don't talk about it, be about it. So if you're saying you're a scientist, well, what are you doing in addition to the science that you do in your lab? How are you understanding the big picture of what it is you're doing, of you know, what you're doing in science? And so for me, that's it. Uh, and so throughout this presentation, I'm gonna give you guys just a few facts uh, and also some nuggets, along with some stories of my life that will hopefully be entertaining for you guys. And so the, the, and these facts actually came from uh, the first of them, all, well, all of them, all of the facts came from the National Science Foundation's uh, study where they saw that uh, female students' achievements in math and science are similar to those of males uh, during uh, K-12, to and they participate in higher-level uh, mathematics and science courses at similar rates as their male peers, with the exception of computer science and engineering. Now, you might ask, well, why is that? Well, some of that may be because that's what men are generally, or boys, are generally pushed towards the math and science, and girls are pushed towards different uh, kinds of sciences. Well, that's something that you know, we, need, we actually need to change. If we're gonna be competitive, actually as a country, because everybody's on the playing field right now. The United States, you know, we lead. If you look at how many journal articles are published by country, China is right there. I think we're like a 12,000 publication difference. So, I mean, and the, one, the, the country that publishes more could be considered the country that knows more, that's doing more. So then we lose, we kind of, we start losing that race. You know, so it's important. And the same is true for STEM education. They have the most computer scientists, they have the most engineers. Where would companies go? Possibly to those, those countries and not to the US. So we have to really keep that in mind and we need all hands on deck <laughs> right here. Uh, oops. oops. That is not correct. Okay, and so let me start with the be let me start in the beginning. So from a young age, it was instilled in me by my grandmother and my mother that education was important. I remember they would always tell me, education is a key. What is it? Education is a um, possession of which no man can be robbed. And boy, were they were they correct with that statement. Uh, and so before I get into my story, my, I really get into my story, uh, i just like to ask, like, when some of you in the room were in third grade, did you know how far you wanted to go education-wise? Did you have any clue what you wanted to do education-wise? Did you? Did you know you had to, you, you, what did you want to? Okay, but, but the question becomes, 
Did you know what it took to be a mad scientist? Did you know you, had to, you needed a master's degree or a PhD or anything like that? Scientist, why not? Just like, I want to be Chucky, why not? <laughs> when I grow up. But, you know, you just didn't know. Well, I'll tell you, for me, when I was in the third grade, one of my teachers, she asked the class, she started asking, I don't know how this conversation came up, but she was asking us, like, how far do you guys want to go in school? And she was like, high school, you want to get an associate's degree, a master's degree, and all the kids in the class, you know, raising their hands, yeah, I want to do that, I want to do that. And I was like, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> so given what, my, what I had been told in my household by my family, I said, well, what's the highest you can go? How far can you go? And she said, a PhD is the highest you can go. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just go and get the PhD. Having no idea what that, what, what, what that entailed. And it's interesting because during that same time, like in elementary school, one summer I had the great idea of wanting to find out what plants and animals were in my community. So I went about the business of collecting jars from a, our candy lady in the, in the, in the neighborhood uh, and collecting jars, getting these jars and filling them with all kinds of little animals and critters in my yard. So I had frogs, I had earthworms, I had little bugs, I had everything. And I would just collect and observe them. My own community was my first laboratory. As a scientist, that was my first laboratory. Until my mother started smelling my little bugs, and <laughs> things started dying because I could—I didn't really know. My, my, you know, it's funny. You know, it's funny. My great aunt told me to feed my turtles bread, no. <laughs> and then when they died, she was like, "Oh." <laughs> And stuff like that. So, but that was my first experience in science. But little did I know, I was actually developing some, I would be honing those skills later on in my life. So, that just brings me to my first nugget to never be afraid to speak your dreams. Because I can't help but think that as a, in the third grade, not knowing what a PhD meant, what really science was, I said I wanted to get a PhD which I guess the star said, well, then that means you want to be a scientist. And so for me, I would implore all of you to please never be afraid to speak your dreams. If you want it, you put it out there in the universe, you work hard, and you can achieve it. And so like some of you in the, that may be in the room, I didn't grow up in the best conditions. Like my mother didn't graduate from high school, and my father wasn't in the picture when I was growing up. So I learned a lot of things the hard way. But I can't help but think that all of those lessons that I learned, those hardships that I went through, those are the things that gave me the grit to achieve my goals. And so I would hope and I would tell you guys that even though you may have adversities and things may not be perfect in your life, to continue to move forward towards your own goals. And so moving on in my education. So throughout primary and secondary schooling, I was always picked for advanced placement classes. So, you know, I kind of knew I was smart and modest. <laughs> but, and I, and I decided in like seventh, eighth grade or so that I wanted to go to college. I said, you know, I'm smart. Why do I need to, you know, I should go to college. It'll be fun. But you know what really pushed it over the line for me? It was the Cosby effect. It was watching the Cosby show in a different world. And I saw that and I was like, no, nah, this is me. <laughs> I was like, that's the life I want. That is the experience that I want in life. But just because you're smart doesn't always mean that, you know, doesn't equate to money, right? To find, you know, having the finances to do things. And so the quest became, you know, how do you finance this thing? And so um, I asked some teachers and, and other folks, how do I get, you know, money to go to college? And this is uh, high school, so I was getting ready for the, you know, you need to make good grades all throughout because that's what college is going to look for. And then they were like, well, you should join ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps. And the school I was going to go to had um, Air Force Junior ROTC. And then they told me, the, mili the military, if you go in the military, they'll pay for college. 
And for every year that you do an ROTC in high school, you'll get an increase in rank. And that was speaking to me. So if I had to go in the military, I wouldn't start off at the bottom. That's never good. And so I said, you know what, I'll join ROTC. <clears throat> and so the first year I joined ROTC, it was a lot of fun. I learned about the military. I gained a greater respect for the men and women of the United States military. And I think that that really has a lot to do with um, why I enjoy my job, why I enjoy you know, supporting our troops. Uh, and so my first year of ROTC was amazing. Uh, my second year, um, I was actually chosen to uh, attend the Cadet Officer Leadership School, which is a week-long immersion course. Uh, within, so basically it was on the Air Force Base in Charleston, South Carolina, where I'm from, and you got to really experience life in the military. And that was a reality check for me, because <laughs> I was like, what I thought was going to be fun and exciting, no. It takes, <laughs> it takes real commitment, it takes real grit. And I started thinking, oh, I might need to start working on a plan B, because I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Uh, and it wasn't until my third year uh, in ROTC where we went off with some Army Rangers into the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> we were in the wilderness, and uh, we were they, were, they were teaching us survival skills. So Air Force Rangers, I'm sorry. They were teaching us survival, survival skills. And they, you know, had us in pontoons sitting on the ground, you know, saying this is how you keep warm. They were picking plants from trees and showing us how to, like, the plant was uh, uh, toxic or whatever. So you put it on your gum and then you wait for a couple hours. I'm like, but what if I'm hungry now? <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. And it wasn't until my fellow cadets who were hardcore, I think all of them, that group, went into the military. <laughs> I didn't go. <laughs> they were eating insects. Because, I mean, as a scientist, I understand it now. Pound for pound, insects have more protein than meat. right? So it was perfectly fine for them to eat. But they were eating ants and things like that. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I really need to work on my plan B. And so. <laughs> I just so I completed my third year, and 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 I ultimately I did enjoy the the um, ROTC. It did teach me discipline. It taught me, you know, it taught me a lot of things. But I started working on Plan B during my uh, senior year, and Plan B was going to be trying to find some money to go to college. And so, uh, as I said, I was always a good student. So, uh, but that didn't always equate to money. And so um, I started applying to all these colleges my senior year, and. Um, Oh, you know what? Actually, I forgot my nugget from that story. You know what my nugget is for that story? Suck it up, little soldier. <laughs> which is what which is what which is what I had to do. I had to suck it up with the things that I liked about being in ROTC and the things that I didn't like about being in ROTC. I had a goal and I had to achieve it. And Suck it up and keep it moving. And you will find that even in your career, everybody doesn't love everybody that they work with, right? It isn't always pleasant, right? But you have a job, you have responsibilities, so it's important that you, so keep that in mind. Suck it up, little soldier, and keep it moving. And this brings me to my next, um, actually. So during my senior year in high school, um, what happened was I started applying for all these uh, various colleges, and, but I wasn't getting any money, which is always a problem. And so one day, I wasn't even going to tell the story, but why not, right? I remember I was um, getting a t-shirt, because we would get t-shirts like every nine weeks, every quarter for like good grades and all this stuff, and I would always get a t-shirt. I was always be at, I would always be I would always get a t-shirt. And one of the uh, administrators at the school would always see me. And we started talking about you know, what my plans were for the future. I guess he was like, OK, well, she's smart. She's always getting these t-shirts, so why not? And he gave me a form after we were talking. And I was telling him, you know, I want to go to college, and, you know, but I need money. He gave me some forms. He told me to fill them out. And I filled them out. 
And I don't know how long after, but it was like the end of senior year. And I was like, oh, God, I'm going to have to go in the military. <laughs> this is what's going to have to happen. I got, a, I got a, um, a thick envelope in the mail. And it was a full four-year academic scholarship to Claflin University. I was like, thank you, God. <laughs> I don't have to go into the military. But this is in no way bashing the military. I totally respect them. But I know I wasn't built for it. I was not built for it. But um, this also brings me to nugget number two, because these are things that you know I personally would have to face. Minorities in STEM and women in STEM will have to face uh, as they um, uh, progress through their career. Uh, so the rates of science and engineering courses taken for girls and women shift at the undergraduate and gender disparities begin to emerge. So it's an opportunity to keep in mind that there are going to be obstacles you face as you get deeper into the sciences uh, and you try to make your mark. There are going to be naysayers, but you still have to keep it going. We need to reverse this stuff. Uh, and so when I, went to, when I went to Claflin, I graduated, uh, oh, I didn't graduate, not yet. I majored in biology and chemistry. And like a lot of students, a lot of ambitious students, I did internships every summer. Uh, I did one at the marine, uh, at, uh, in marine biology. I did one in microbiology and molecular biology, and actually in the Drosophila melanogaster uh, model system. And so I, uh, after after undergraduate school, I was recruited to um, Dr. Uh, Dutteroy's lab at Howard University. And you know, like any good scientist. I went to meetings every year and presented my work. But one of the most interesting uh, opportunities that I had during uh, grad school was attending the Marine Bi Biological Laboratory's uh, Biology of Aging course in 2005. And this was a great opportunity for me to learn about, learn, uh, ab about aging from the best and brightest in the field. And uh, I also got the opportunity to hear my first Nobel talk, Nobel laureate talk, and that was from uh, Linda Buck. Uh, uh, she did some. She uh, got the Nobel Prize with uh, uh, Stephen Axel, oh, Richard Axel, uh, in mapping the olfactory um, process from the nose to the brain. So actually, they, they mapped the process of smell. So I thought that was like totally cool. I was like, oh my God, I'm at MBL and I'm listening to a Nobel laureate. My life is awesome. And also, <laughs> so, and, but with being, so during that time, I was also thinking like, is the lab it? What else happens outside of the lab? So I wanted a different kind of experience. And I had always, always, always had an interest in biotechnology. And so I applied for the MBL, uh, not the MBL, I'm sorry, for the uh, Minority and Indigenous Fellows Program, which was sponsored by Amgen that I have there for you guys uh, to take with you. And this was an opportunity for me to learn about actually the business of science. Because people aren't doing research in the lab just, to do, just for the sake of research. There are people out there that want to make money on the findings of, uh, uh, that are from, from all this research that's being done. And, when you, and going to the biotech industry organization's annual meeting, I learned what all that was about. You had people walking around there. Everybody had a molecule or something that they wanted to develop, and they wanted a billion dollars. That's what they were looking for. And I was like, oh, so this is what happens to all that work. And so that really opened my eyes to the broad picture of science and how it, Im how it actually impacts lives. Right? You see all these articles and you know, cell science and nature, but how does that impact people's lives? And it's these organizations that these uh, types of organizations that you know, take technologies from the bench to the bedside. And so that was really eye opener uh, for me. Uh, and so, and at, so at the conclusion of uh, graduate school, I went to work with Dr. Linda Resar um, at Johns Hopkins. And that, again, was a great opportunity. Um, I got to postdoc at one of the best universities um, in the country, and I took advantage of every opportunity that became um, available to me uh, while I was there. I published, and I you know, made friends with a lot of uh, great people. 
and learned a, learned a whole lot. But then what happened was, I was like, do I want the lab to be, you know, my entire life? Because you, because when you get to be a postdoc, you see really how life is. You see really the grind of having to look for money, and it is a grind, and you have to be passionate about the work that you're that you're doing. Uh, and so, but for me, I wanted to see again. You know, I had this passion about you know industry and what else was out there, and so I joined the organization Women in Bio, and Women in Bio is a great organization. Uh, for students, and I, I actually have some information on these slides uh, for you guys. Uh, so, Women in Bio is a great organization because it supports women from middle school, right? right? We have these issues with middle school girls not really in, uh, being exposed to science, all the way up to late career stage uh, women. I spent five years in Women in Bio. I learned how to network. I learned. I. I connected with so many people in the state of Maryland, you know, learn, learned about so many different opportunities in the state of Maryland. Uh, it's, it was a wonderful experience. And when I came in, it was kind of like baptism by fire a bit because, <laughs> because I came in and I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll be a member and do all stuff. And they were like, hey, do, have you ever raised money before? And I was like, I did it in undergrad, you know, for the school. And so I... <laughs> And I was like, okay. And two months later, I was the chair of sponsorship. And I was pulling in the money, yes I was. Uh, and so, at the end of like my first nine months or so, they were like, hey, you wanna be vice president of the chapter in the coming year. So I spent two years as the vice president of the Washington DC Baltimore chapter of Women in Bio. And it was an amazing exper experience. I would implore all of the women and men we like men and in, in women in bio <laughs> in there, uh, in here to just go and research women in bio and see the great things that they do. They have a lot of awesome networking opportunities. And what I liked about women in bio is it brought together, it brought me around women at the various at various levels and various places in science. And I got to see what they were doing versus what I was doing, what they had done versus what I had done. So it was kind of like, you know, outside of what you and your peers do at UDC, right? So you're seeing what students at Georgetown do. You're seeing what students at Hopkins do and, every, and everywhere. And it's all virtually go to, to places except when they have events. So it's a great opportunity to just to be into network and to be like, I, I absolutely loved uh, my experience at Women in Bio, and eventually I became the president. I led that organization, loved every minute of it, uh, still support that organization, uh, and so I would implore all, everyone in here to, you know, just Google Women in Bio and see the amazing things that they're doing. Uh, and also, and also, uh, while I was at, uh, during my postdoc, I did a year-long Activate program, which was actually funded by the National Science Foundation. And it was an opportunity for high-tech uh, women in, in uh, technology to, to learn entrepreneurship and learn everything they need to do to take a technology from uh, basically from the and how to find out what resources are available within the community to help you along the way in doing that. You know, it's the Activate program doesn't exist anymore. Uh -oh. Actually, it was like Activate and then Innovate programs, but they're not funded um, anymore. But it was a wonderful program, and there are still programs out there uh, that you can that that want to take uh, that want to support entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is big in Maryland and in a lot of states because entrepreneurs actually they they employ people. So there are lots of grants, and I would um, advise you to look up Maryland TEDCO, Technology Development Corporation. That's a great Maryland TEDCO, T-E-D-C-O. They actually have a pre, they have a pre-seed funding program for um, uh, for minorities. They give out I think it's like 20 awards uh, per year to support. Uh, minority businesses, and they do it for all. They have like some for large scale businesses. It's like everything. Did you guys know that uh, in Baltimore City, there's going to be a cyber town? So in in the Port Covington area, they're um, trying to get companies in the, actually the Port Covington area 
the president of Under Armour. And so they're uh, developing what's, called, what's gonna be called Cybertown. So they're, they're trying to recruit a bunch of cybersecurity companies to come to the Baltimore area. And then there's a new uh, building coming up by, um, by the FDA in White Oak. There was just a, a, a groundbreaking telling you. There's like so much going on. It's just you just have to get out there and then expose yourself and you will see just everything that's around you and a lot of things that you can just easily touch. And so, and so that's, so that brings me to my third nugget, which is to diversify your experiences. If you see things that you find out about it, keep on finding out about it until you don't like it anymore. <laughs> until you hit that road, until you hit that, 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 um, that brick wall, it's like, okay, I think I, you know, I see why this won't work. But I always do a deep dive. If I'm interested in something, I'm gonna, <laughs> and meet people, connect with people. You know, work with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is awesome. I wasn't even gonna talk about that. LinkedIn is awesome. It's just, go, get your profile. If you see somebody that you think is interesting, you know, reach out to them. Send them a note though, don't just do random stuff because you know, you can get in trouble for that. But just send them a note, say, hey, you know, you have some interests that, you know, that similar interest in me. You know, can we connect? And then send them, a, if they accept, that's wonderful. <laughs> and then you can send them a note and then, you know, talk to them. Uh, so, and I've done that. I do that. <laughs> because I feel like you may have the information that I need. And so, I mean, be kind. <laughs> and so, enough about, and so, uh, after my postdoc, I actually decided I wanted to go into industry. And it's crazy because I work for a government contractor, Lidos. We're like a big 33 firm. And I, I, I truly believe that they wanted me to, um, at least that's what I choose to believe. They wanted me to do the Howard Lidos Strategic University Alliance thing because they saw how connected I was and how I was um, in the community. And not based on anything I said, but based on what they could see from what I was doing and what I was involved in and what was on my resume. And so to be at a big IT company, the Strategic University Alliance is for recruiting engineers. And so I was like, for me, I was like, why did they choose me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but you know, we're, we're actually connected. We're you know, trying to bring in students. We're engaging. We're supporting research there. And that's all because of me. And that's an accomplishment that I can say that I brought to a big $33,000, $10 billion IT behemoth. That was my little piece. But it's because I decide that I was gonna be fearless. And I wasn't gonna allow, you know, the fact that I'm a molecular biologist stop me from doing something awesome. <laughs> Why would I do that? Uh, and so, I would just implore all of you uh, to take uh, opportunities by the horn. But I also wanna share with you guys some, um, just some, some statistics. And so, one of the interesting statistics that I found was that women have earned 57% of all the bachelor's degrees and about half of all the science and engineering bachelor's degrees since the 1990s. So why is there still such a small percentage of women? And we also are 24% of the, um, we're actually half of the internet users, but we only represent 24% of the people in the computing space. Can you imagine how much better the internet would be if more women, if more women you know? And how much further this, company, this country would be if we just allowed women to be women, to be ambitious, to be brilliant, to be who they, tr to be their full selves. You know, and that's honestly what my efforts are. I want, to, I want there to be a day when you can be your full self. You can say something outrageous and you can do it. And nobody's gonna look at you and say, women don't do that. Ha, yes they do. <laughs> In fact, we have Ms. Cam Catherine Johnson, right? From Hidden Figures, who knew? Who knew that she was that mathematician? Can you imagine if she was allowed to be her full self? What she could have accomplished? We would have already been on Mars. <laughs> we, we might have been on Mars 10 or 20 years before, you know? 
we have Ms. Mae Jamison. And I, I truly believe that with Katherine Johnson's work, led paved the way in a way for Mae Jamison to be the first African American woman to go into outer space many, many years later. And then we have Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Facebook. I love her because she has, um, she has a website, leanin.org, where she's saying some of the same things I'm saying. Women need to lean in. You hear these conversations that men are having, you need to be, be a part of them. You have, you have ideas, you have thoughts, lean in. And I would advise you to go to leanin.org and sign up because there are actually groups. And so that's a great opportunity to have like-minded people that are gonna push you. So when you may think, no, I don't wanna rock the boat. And they're like, rock it, why not? <laughs> what do you have to lose? Kimberly Bryant, the founder of Black Girls Code. And actually Black Girls Code now has an office on the third floor of the Google building in New York, Google offices in New York City. So they're training young women from all over New York in computer science and coding. This just happened like last month or so. So there are women out there, and you know what inspired her? She went to Silicon Valley and she didn't see very many people of color. Actually, I think it's like one or two percent when they, when they put out the numbers, it's, it's horrible. But she said she wanted to make a difference. Compounded by the fact that her daughter came home and, and her daughter at like 11 years old saw that the teachers were spending more time with the boys when it came to engineering than the girls. And so instead of her going to the school and saying this and saying that, she said, I'm gonna do something about it. She didn't talk about it, right? She did something about it. And you can do the same thing. In fact, uh, so and even with all these things that I'm saying, there's a financial piece to all of this. Because this country, uh, so currently women make up 24% of the computing jobs, right? So by 2025, in order for us to be competitive and in order for us to be able to fulfill the job requirements, that number needs to be at 39%. With the rate that we're going now, it's gonna be at 22%. So what's gonna happen? So we need all hands on deck. We need all, and this is the sciences, period. <laughs> this is not, I don't care if you're a biologist, chemist, computer scientist, engineer, we need all hands on deck. We need everybody's ingenuity. And we need, and if that means we need to break down some doors and make some people angry and uncomfortable, then we have to do that. We have to do it because, and, and you're looking, and when you, th when you think about that, when you make that decision, you have to think about the big picture. What is the big picture? So somebody may not like for you to do something, but they, they may not understand that there are people coming for us. They're coming for the number one spot. And so, and so we as a country need to really recognize that we need to get more people in the STEMs. And so there are some ideas as to how, how to do that. And um, one of the things uh, that was offered um, was to, um, offer summer camps for girls, for young girls. And this could be for computer science, engineering camps, even for just basic science camps. Because they found that young, young girls, that um, young middle school girls that, um, that attended summer camps were 81% more likely to want to major in, in, in science than the 51% that didn't. We could also train women who maybe weren't computer scientists in undergrad. Train them in computer science. Get more people on deck and more people um, in, uh, in the field. And then also inspire uh, more young girls and treat them it's not in supporting organizations that try to expose young girls to the sciences. And then also support organizations that try to keep women in the sciences. Oh. And so I want to share with you guys a few uh, web addresses. Um, I think these slides are going to be, they can be made available. That's perfectly fine. So the International Center Flyer uh, on the table, they have SMDP Biotech and SMDP MedTech that's coming up uh, next year. That's actually the International 
that's the organization. Uh, that's my minority and indigenous fellows program actually from back in the day. But they're still around. There are some wonderful opportunities there. If you get accepted, you get like paired with a mentor for a year. That's a great opportunity. Uh, so I would implore all of you to apply. And if you don't get in this year, just keep on applying. It's, it'll be fine. <laughs> and also uh, Women in Bio. Um, I would implore you to just go check out Women in Bio. And BEA, Black Engineer of the Year Award um, Conference. Has anybody ever been to BEA? How many engineers are in here? And you haven't been to BEA? Oh, you have to go. it would be wonderful. Um, that's a, we actually, Lidos recruits a lot um, at BEA. And actually, uh, and it's, a, it's, it's basically um, a conference where uh, companies can come and recruit students and they offer uh, like professional development opportunities as well. Oh, and also Black Girls Code. Um, I would employ you all to you know, engage with Black Girls Code. Uh, and actually, and even if you are not a computer science or engineering student, you can still participate in Black Girls Code. Because coding, you know, computer science pays good money. So, then, you know, and, it's a good, and it would be a good skill set to have. Good? So, I just want to let you guys know that on Saturday, November 10th, uh, the DC chapter of uh, Black Girls Code is having an event. But you might see me there. Just, <laughs> just, <laughs> just, to, just to find out, like, exactly what that is. Like, have you, do you guys know what a Raspberry Pi is? Right, I didn't know what that was. It's like a little computer. That's cool. Like, I don't know how to build one or anything like that, but it doesn't matter. I still know what it is. Um, and so I would implore all of you to check it out. Possibly come out, you'll learn something. You can help the kids, inspire the kids. Good. Uh, and so that actually ends it for me. I just want to leave you guys with those nuggets. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, my discussion and my journey in STEM. The saga continues. Uh, I don't know what's coming up next, but I'm sure it'll be exciting. Uh, and so if you guys have any questions or anything like that, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes. Correct. It's a matter, you know, for me, it's a matter to be able to convey my thoughts properly and for, to get my point across. So being able to, to write, I mean, I, at work, I mean, we do talk about people that can't write. <laughs> honestly, I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm telling you, we do. We do talk about people that don't write, and you, you will get known for that. Like, I don't, I've heard that as well, and that just doesn't resonate with me. Just like, um, you know, somebody may have said, well, you're a good technical writer, but you're not a good, you know, layperson writer. I can do both. <laughs> so, and I, and, and, and I think that's, and I think that's, that's a reasonable thing to assume that you can be no matter the situation, you should be able to get your point across. I would not agree with that at all, especially in this day and age, because I'm telling you, it's all hands on deck. 
We need to be able to do like everything because what you're not doing, believe me, somebody else is doing it. So you sit there and you're in the comfort of not being able to write, who am I going to, you know, who would I hire? You, you both have the same technical abilities, but who am I going to hire? Somebody who I don't have to like chase after and, you know, I can go give a customer, give a customer, a, a customer their document from the person that can write well, or I have to send it to editing and delay that process for the person that doesn't write well. And do you even understand what they're saying? You know, can they get their point across? So it's becoming, don't believe that, that's hype. Do not believe it. You need to be able to write, you need to be able to write well. I don't care, I don't care what profession. <laughs> you need to be able to write well. And technically, you know, being able to write technically is, is great. I mean, you definitely should do that if you're in the sciences. But otherwise, you need to also be able to, you know what, I think it's, I think it's good when you can write for the technical and also for the lay audiences. And I do, like before I did a lot of technical writing, but now I do a lot of lay writing. You know, I can't use the big word manganese superoxide dismutase, you know, A1 binding to the da-da-da receptor. No, 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 no. <laughs> you can't do that. You have to be able to, you know, speak to where the general public can understand. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, yeah. so, uh I don't fail, actually. <laughs> a missed opportunity. Have I had any missed opportunities? Hmm. You know, it's funny because the way that I see missed opportunities is it wasn't meant for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I may have applied for a job that I thought was, oh, you know what, I'll tell you this. So I, in, uh, in my biography, you saw that I wrote for the future of biopharma, a few articles on biologics and biosimilars, right? Does everybody know what biologics and biosimilars are? Everybody that knows me, they know what it is. <laughs> so biologics, everybody has seen those commercials with, um, you know, um, Herceptin and uh, all these different um, monoclonal antibodies to treat various diseases, like whether it's, so, so, yeah, so those are what you would call innovator molecules. So those are like the aspirins of the world, right? Aspirin is aspirin. Uh, so those are the original molecules. Well, at some point, they lose their patent. And companies are then able to come in and develop them and sell them. Well, biosimilar, biologics is a billion dollar industry. One biosimilar would bring in, like for Amgen, one biosimilar would bring in $9 billion annually. And so when this biosimilar goes off patent, like a, like a Herceptin, uh, once it goes off of patent, other people can enter the market. But what's interesting about biosimilars is they don't lose the value the way small molecules do. And I guess I should say this too. So imagine a, bi a biologic versus a drug is like comparing a B-52 bomber to a tricycle in size and in complexity. So with a drug, you put two chemicals together, boom, 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 you got aspirin. With a biologic, it's usually done, it's done in a living system. And you have to harvest it, and you have to do all that. So they're very expensive. So I was very interested in that market, and I was writing stuff, and I remember I had an interview. I actually went to New York for that interview. And I was gonna go, I was gonna move to London. I had, <laughs> they had told me all, it was decision resource group. And uh, I got into the interview, and I was, and I froze. I froze. I lost my opportunity to go to London. And that, would, to me, was a missed opportunity. Um, God. 
<laughs> I, I, I thought I'd never tell that story in public. But anyway, um, it <laughs> that's what happened. But I'm still interested in that market. I'm, you know, I may develop my own. You know, I may start my own biotech company. I have all that experience, right? I should. I should speak that. I'm going to speak that into existence. So look out for me. <laughs> No, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Thank you, right? I'm like, no. It's actually motivation, right? So next time you guys see me somewhere, you'll be like, did you ever start that company you said you were going to start? And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> so, OK. okay. Dr. Belton so very much, um, and I don't want to stop the question and answer session, um, but I do want to open up um, the refreshments because I know it is lunchtime for most of you, so feel free to make your way over um, to the refreshments, but you may go ahead and continue with the question and answer session if you wish. So cool. Thank you so much. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you.